Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Jennifer LaRue. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And I cannot tell you how delighted I am to see so many people from all over the place joining us this evening to talk about this incredible new book, uh, one of the top 10 notable books of last year, um, Abe, uh, with its author, David S. Reynolds, and our own assistant curator, um, Mallory Howard, who is a big uh, Abraham Lincoln freak. Um, so we'll talk about them more in a moment when I formally introduce them. I'm not going to talk for too long. I just want to uh, introduce you to some of the features of Crowdcast, which is the platform that we use for our virtual programs. We've done something like 150 of these programs since the pandemic began. Our first one was on April April 13th of 2020, and we found it just be a really way, wonderful way to stay connected with people all over the world and uh, to make new friends and to keep in touch with our old friends. So again, I'm so delighted to see you all here uh, with us tonight. You are very uh, adept at using the chat. I'm going to give you credit for that. You've already figured that out. And please do continue to chat throughout the program. That is part of the fun of the virtual programs. And it's one of the things that actually gives it an edge over an in-person program because you're not allowed are not supposed to talk during um, in-person programs when the speakers are speaking. So this is kind of the best of both worlds. You can pay attention and be riveted by what they're saying, but also chime in with your own comments and observations uh, and connections. So continue to do that, please. However, toward the end of our program, we are going to um, have audience questions. And if you can um, help me out, please, by placing those down at the bottom of the screen where you see ask a question. Rather than putting them in the chat, that'll make that part of the program so much easier to manage. And it's kind of fun to go and look at other people's questions. You can upvote questions, and that kind of moves them to the top of the pile if you have the same question that somebody else had. Um, so please um, do put your questions there, and that'll be a big help to us. Thank you. While we're down at that part of the screen, I would like to draw your attention to that long green bar that says, your support is vital to the Mark Twain House and Museum. Please donate here. Um, that's a real true statement, and, and uh, we really do um, value every single penny that anybody is able to donate to us through uh, that donate button. Um, we have been lucky to have largely weathered the pandemic in pretty good shape, although we did you know, staff was furloughed for a long time for a day a week, and we were without our major source of revenue, which is our wonderful guided house tour um, for, for a good part of the pandemic. I'm pleased to say we're back in business with that, and people are coming in droves. Um, the parking lot is always full license plates from all over the place. So that's wonderful. But we do have some catch-up ball to play, I'll be honest with you. Um, and it has not been easy for us or for any other organization or, or business, I have to admit. But um, I say that's my way of saying that anything that you are willing and able to share to help support our virtual programs or public programs, just the museum in general. Uh, we deeply appreciate every single penny, the board of trustees and the staff, and um, we put every single penny to extremely good use. So you can trust us um, to do that. So having said all that, I'd like to uh, introduce our, our speakers once I acknowledge our, our sponsors. Um, like so many of our programs, tonight's program is sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation and by our media sponsor, Connecticut Public WNPR. And it's produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord. Um, the late Frank Lord was a deeply um, committed and beloved trustee of the museum for many, many years. And um, we're just so honored to be able to offer these programs with the support of that funding in his honor. Thank you for that. So our guest tonight, as I said, Mallory Howard is the assistant curator of the Mark Twain House and Museum, and she is a self-avowed Lincoln devotee. Um, so uh, she knows her stuff and was the perfect person to have in conversation with our guest of honor, David S. Reynolds, who's a distinguished professor at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He's the author of Walt Whitman's America, a cultural biography, winner of the Bancroft Prize and the Ambassador Book Award. His other books include Beneath the American Renaissance, winner of the Christian Gauss Award, John Brown Abolitionist, Waking Giant, America in the Age of Jackson, Mightier Than the Sword, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and The Battle for America, and Lincoln's Selected Writings. So I'm going to bring them both on screen with me, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming David Reynolds and Mallory Howard. And it takes a second here, so be patient. Uh -huh. 
There we go. Oh, welcome, David. And let's get Mallory up here as well. Very nice to be here. Hi, Mallory. Hi, Mallory. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. So I usually do this part of, of my um, remarks before before I introduce our guests, but there's a reason I've waited. Usually I hold up a copy of the book that we're talking about, but we are the paperback book launch um, for this uh, book. Uh, this is uh, David's first time talking uh, on, in support of the paperback version of this book. We are so tickled and honored to have that role, but it means that I don't yet have a copy myself. So I'm gonna ask, uh, Mallory's gonna hold up the hardback copy, and David, you have a copy of the paperback? That, so thank you. Um, there's a link at the very top of the chat and I will repaste it uh, down below so it's a little easier to find. Um, just know that what you're purchasing through that link, first of all, is a signed copy, which you don't get everywhere if you go somewhere else, which we know you can do, but you do get a signed copy. And also your purchase benefits the Mark Twain House and Museum, which we deeply appreciate. But do know that you are getting the paperback edition of Abe and, and not the hardback. So having said all that, I'm going to sit back and relax and enjoy. And uh, Mallory, you'll let me know when it's time to come back up for um, the question and answers? Yes, sounds good. All right. Welcome again and have fun. I'll be back later. Thank you. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited to talk about Abe. Great and to be here. I consider myself very well read on the subject of Abraham Lincoln, and I have to say, Yours is one of my absolute favorite biographies I've ever read of him. Thank you. Thank you very much. I loved writing it, enjoyed it very much. <laughs> I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And so to start off, you know, there are so many biographies of Abraham Lincoln. He's one of the most written about figures in our history. Why did you decide to tackle him? And what sets yours apart from other biographies out there? Um, there are more than 16,000 books on Lincoln. Uh, he was our greatest president. Um, and no wonder, you know, so many books have been written about him and a bunch of really good biographies. However, they're what I call standard biographies. They follow his life and maybe they branch out well to his politics, his attitude towards slavery and, and, and relations with his cabinet and all of that. But, you know, today in our world, we realize that uh, the individual life intersects with culture and with politics and, and uh, to, with culture in a larger sense and one's individual culture, whether it be family, church, school, or whatever, intersects with certain strands, or sometimes more than one strand in the larger culture and kind of defines the way we think inwardly. And it's that kind of Lincoln that has never been probed before. Uh, he lived in um, the greatest a literary period in American history. It was a period of um, innovations in music and popular writing and poetry and so forth. And he was very much aware of all of this. And um, one biographer, David Donald, who wrote, wrote a very good biography, but he, he says, Lincoln was the least prepared uh, person to ever enter office, higher office. Mm -hmm because he had less than one year of school, you know, seventh grade, a few months in seventh grade, a few months in, you know, uh, eighth grade, that kind of thing. Very scattered sc schooling, l less than one year. But in my view, he was the, the best prepared. Why? He was so open to experience on every level. He could recite Shakespeare by the page, but not too many people except for actors, perhaps, who can do that. And he loved body humor, everything from the, from the highest to the lowest. And his contemporary, Ralph Waldo Emerson, said that of all our political figures, Lincoln is the only one that crosses the whole range of experience from high to the humblest. And it's, it's that Lincoln that I'm trying to capture. And I, I think you definitely succeeded in that. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I want to ask you some general questions about things that I found particularly interesting uh, as we go through. But one of the things that I've noticed being an avid uh, follower of all things Lincoln is not much was known uh, to me about his earlier life and his family. And you really take the time to dig a little bit more into that, which I think is fascinating. And one of the things I found the most interesting was when you talked about 
the Puritans versus Quakers versus Cavalier and how Lincoln presented himself as a descendant of Quakers. And I could not stop reading this part. I thought it was so interesting. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, what was really interesting was that he identified with Quakers. Meanwhile, there's one identifiable Quaker in his background, like a great grandmother named Rebecca Flowers. Uh, but he says, oh, I'm from a family of Quakers. He knew <laughs> that on his father's side, he goes back to early Puritan New England. And on his mother's side, he goes back to uh, the Cavalier gentry of Virginia. And why didn't he talk about that? Because we know what cultural hot, hot wires are today. You know, whether you say socialist or whether you say this or that or the other, uh, those were very hot wires. And a lot of people were saying, oh, those damn Puritans over there. And others were saying those, those damn Cavaliers. Uh, and a lot of people tried to, to say this, the whole Civil War was about these two opposing civilizations. And he preferred not to sort of expose those two wires. Now, somebody else did noticed he's really the combination of the Puritan and the Cavalier, which essentially he was. And he was very, very curious about his Puritan background. And unfortunately, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, he, he didn't really know much about his Virginia background, but he was also very curious about that. He thought, oh, I'm descended from this Cavalier, he didn't use that word, but this aristocratic, a Virginia planter, a nobleman. And then on my mother's side, um, on my father's side, he knew that Samuel Lincoln was a Puritan who had come over in 1637. He said it was 1638, settled in Massachusetts, and then the family spread. But, and, and he even told a visitor, I would love to go back to England to see that whole context. And yet he never talked about that at all. He said, I'm a Quaker. Why? Because Quakers were known in America at that time to be the bridge, the bridge between the, they settled in the mid Atlantic uh, in Pennsylvania, parts of New York and, 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 you know, parts of the upper South and they were a real buffer and they were considered and they were even accepted um, uh, by Southerners, even though they were anti-slavery, but still they were very peaceable. They didn't want to go, go to war over slavery. And then they were admired by Northerners because they did have, an anti-slavery impulse. So it was a perfect buffer for Lincoln to identify with. I'm a Quaker. And all the early biographers just said he's he's a he's of Quaker background. Yeah. Yeah. And I love how you explained that. I think, you know, hearing you talk about it both now and in your book and going further into it in your book, it just makes so much sense. And that him being in the center and kind of trying to to balance both sides is really woven throughout, you know, your entire book and his entire life of having to maintain that balance. Yeah, exa exactly. He was compared with, and he compared himself to Blondin. Blondin was a tightrope walker who went back and forth across Niagara Falls. Blondin went on stilts. He went backwards, forward. He did somersaults and he carried a man on his back across Niagara Falls, no net, uh, and pushed a wheelbarrow. And so often uh, in my book, I have many re reproductions of, of, of these images of Lincoln as blonde and keeping that center course. And uh, when a couple of uh, delegations came to him during the Civil War and said, uh, President, why can't you make this a more anti-slavery war from the start, from the very beginning? He said, if I were Blondin going across Niagara Falls and I was pushing a wheelbarrow that had the entire American future in my wheelbarrow, would you would you say, Blondin, uh, you know, uh, turn right, Blondin, turn left? No, you would allow me to keep right on my tightrope. He knew if he said the wrong thing, he would lose one of the five border states who were slaveholding states who were lowly. And, and he said, if I if we lose Kentucky, we're gonna we're gonna lose the Missouri. We're we're gonna lose the, the, lose this entire war very, very easily. I have to be very, very cautious. I have to be blonde. Yeah. And that, that makes sense. I mean, I remember even in your book, you talk about um, how careful he had to be when writing his speeches and how he would have other people read them to make sure the words that he is choosing are not too aggressive to either side. And so I can't imagine the pressure he is under just anytime he speaks, he writes that he has to maintain that balance and not 
you know, tipping too heavy one side to the other, just the pressure of that. Yeah. And that's one reason why he loved poetry, because poetry really condenses uh, meaning and feeling. Uh, and he loved poetry above all. And his best speeches are prose poems. The Gettysburg Address is only two, uh, 270 words. It, it only took him two minutes to deliver. The other guy that day went on for two hours. But the other guy said, you said much more in two minutes than I said in two hours. And the uh, second best speech in American history, the second inaugural address is like 800 words. And, but they're, they condense so much meaning and feeling. And no, he didn't uh, uh, go on and on because if he did, you know, uh, a lot of other orators of that day would kind of spurt out these invectives and, you know, they would damn the other side, they would criticize the other side and all of that. He affirmed these universal truths about the American de democratic experiment. Uh, and they, his, his best speech is really strained toward not only the union of the states, but also justice, human justice. And that's why to this very day, uh, people read the Gettysburg Address and also the first inaugural, the second inaugural. But yeah, he, he not only spent a long time on them, but he had a lot of people, as you mentioned, read them and go over them. And he took their criticisms. Uh, the last paragraph of the first inaugural about the better angels of our nature. He came up with that phrase, but somebody else actually gave him that paragraph and said something about the angel, the angels of the, the nation leading us across, you know, uh, whatever he, he said, no, the better angels of our nature. And uh, he boiled it down. He, he would take other people's advice, but he would boil, boil it down into his own beautiful rhythmic prose. And he, he spoke beautifully. He wrote beautifully. And, something that a lot of people don't know is what a fantastic storyteller he was and how funny he was. And he loved to entertain people by telling jokes. And I know that he was a fan of humorists of the day, like Petroleum Nasby and Artemis Ward. Can you talk a little bit about their influence on him and how that may have even benefited him politically or while in office? Well, he was a, a man who loved to tell stories. And when he went on the law circuit, he had been a lawyer for two decades before he was president. And in those days, they didn't have lawyers in most towns. So he would have to go on the circuit with a whole bunch of other lawyers and judges. And they didn't have any entertainment. So at night, they would just tell stories to each other, like a story fest. One after they would riff off, OK, Abe, you tell your story. And you know, OK, John, you tell yours. So we went on and on telling these stories. He had a great sense of humor. They would stay in uh, inns that were just horrible. Uh, sometimes 20 people to an inn. They, they're very small, tiny, with bed bugs and, uh, uh, you know, roaches and all kinds of things. And he once sat to dinner at uh, an inn and he said, in the absence of dinner, I think I'll dive into this cabbage. And he, he also said, if this is tea, could you please bring me some coffee? If this is coffee, <laughs> could you bring me some tea? <laughs> and... Uh, but he, he was often very, very witty like that. Uh, and he loved these humorists like Petroleum Nasby. And uh, he said, he even jokingly said, you know, I would trade my presidency to write like this guy. His real name was David Ross Locke. But Petroleum Nasby was almost beyond Saturday Night Live because he would impersonate the opposition of Lincoln, these copperheads who were very, very... They wanted to end the war and allow slavery to go on. They were Northerners, allow slavery to go on, make peace with the South, and the heck with slavery. And so uh, Petroleum Nasby uh, impersonated these people as really terrible, but also also humorously terrible right. um, racists, you know, uh, racists. And uh, some people said that uh, there were three forces that uh, defeated slavery. Grant, Sherman, and Petroleum Nasby. I mean, um, and, and, and Lincoln used to love, uh, he would memorize Petroleum Nasby's sketches and walk around with a pamphlet uh, in his uh, pocket and read it out loud, even at pressure points during the war. So, yeah. It's good to always keep a sense of humor. And we know that he tried to do that 
and we don't blame them for sure. Um, and uh, there are several amazing figures besides Lincoln that you talk about in your book. John Brown, of course, Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, Elizabeth Keckley make appearances. Someone that really jumped out to me was Anna Ella Carroll. And I thought her story was just absolutely amazing. Can you talk a little bit about her? Because I had never heard of her before until I read your book. Yeah, she was known as Anne. Her real name was Anna Ella Carroll. And she was from Maryland. And she had inherited 20 enslaved people, but she freed them when Lincoln, because she had a kind of conversion to anti-slavery and she really loved Lincoln. She um, wrote, she was multi-talented. She wrote a whole bunch of pamphlets that were quite well, widely read. Lincoln read them and he met with her, defending Lincoln's use of the war powers, even when he uh, canceled habeas corpus for a while. And uh, she really wrote the most convincing justification for Lincoln during the Civil War for temporarily suspending habeas corpus and had a lot of influence. Also, she uh, was a military strategist and she figured out the, the real details of the Tennessee River campaign. Uh, she met with uh, Grant, with Sherman, uh, and with a lot of other generals, and they were thinking of going down the Mississippi River with these very, very heavy gunboats, but she, fig you know, she saw that they would get grounded down there. They were extremely heavy, and it, they'd, they'd be caught downstream if they were fired on, and they'd be crippled. They couldn't go back up, upstream. So she figured out that the Tennessee River, the details of the Tennessee River campaign, which really opened up, well, Fort Henry, Fort Donelson, eventually Vicksburg. Well, Vicksburg also was down the Mississippi, but uh, to approach the Mississippi from the back, and this opened up the whole kind of what was then the Western theater. So she was she was just just brilliant, you know, brilliant. Yeah, I, I love learning about her. Another person that I was hoping you could touch on uh, was Ellsworth and his influence on Lincoln. Elmer Ellsworth, you know, these are these are the kind of people that frankly haven't been talked, but they were very, very important, uh, important but they, they haven't been included in a lot of biographies. He was a young man originally from New York and went out to Illinois. He worked with Lincoln for a while. He had a kind of military genius. He organized these military troops even before the war, and he drilled them. He They were called Zouaves, Z-O-U-A-V-E-S, Zouaves. And they wore this kind of oriental um, a costume that later became very popular for soldiers during the Civil War. And he was a short man, only like five foot six, and yet he could take the biggest bully and kind of whip him into shape. And they, they were terrified of him, you know, and then everything... He was also uh, uh, very, very devoted to Lincoln. And uh, he, uh, in the first really encounter, big encounter of the war, he went across um, the river Potomac to Alexandria, Virginia, where there was a Confederate flag flying on top of a hotel there, which Lincoln could actually see from the White House. And it really bothered Lincoln. It bothered everybody, the Confederate flag. And uh, Ellsworth's men said, we're going to go up and get it. He said, no, I'm, I'm going to go get that flag. So he goes up to the roof, gets the flag, halfway down, the hotel keeper, who's a Confederate, shoots him and kills him immediately. And Lincoln becomes totally devastated by it. Lincoln writes this incredibly tender letter to the parents and said, you know, he was like my son. He was like losing his son. He was so, so close to me. And I really admired his military um, uh, he, did, he didn't use the word genius, but his military capability, because at the time he really wanted Ellsworth to, or it, we didn't have a U.S. Army then. It was, it, it was kind of dispersed, and uh, we had state militias, and the early, most of the early volunteers were from the individual states, and he wanted Ellsworth to kind of organize this into a real uh, cohesive army. But unfortunately, Ellsworth died, and he became a, an incredible martyr. Uh, throughout, the, there were songs written about him, and uh, the soldiers would would yell, "Remember Ellsworth!" as they charged in into a battle. Sometimes charged to the deaths. So yeah, he was a very inspiring figure. And just another example, unfortunately, of how much tragedy Lincoln suffered, you know, throughout 
that that war time, especially with you know the loss of uh, his child and and dealing with the loss of soldiers and just one tragedy after another, and how he has to deal with all of that is hard to hard to believe. Yeah, um, but- he, when he when he lost um, people that were close to him, he would sometimes break down in in tears, and and, and he would eventually recover. His his wife Mary had a little more trouble recovering when their 11 year old Willie uh, passed away uh, of typhoid in, in 1862. So she, she took, took a little longer and she wore black and everything like that. But, and he had to recover. He went into his room and he just cried his head off, but he just had to, he had a nation to lead, you know? Right. So he kept going forward. Now, speaking of a nation to lead, it seems that he very quickly was able to get his head around military strategy and be able to really be the commander in chief. Obviously he had a lot of issues with some of his generals like McClellan and Meade and was very frustrated by them. But I think it goes to show how intelligent he was to be able to get such a grasp of military strategy. And can you talk about about that a little bit? Well, he was a, an amateur at the beginning. It's true he had served in the Black Hawk War briefly in 1832, whereas Jefferson Davis was not an amateur, his opponent. Uh, He had been in the Mexican War and all of that. And yet Lincoln was a quick learner. He perhaps stuck too long with McClellan, his first big general, but McClellan had all, McClellan really inspired the troops. He was very charismatic and everything. Trouble with McClellan and is, is that once he got on the battlefield, he really overestimated the size of the enemy and he became rather timid. And finally, but Lincoln shifted and he realized this isn't working out. Meade is not working out. Uh, Burnside didn't work out. Uh, fighting Joe H- Hooker uh, didn't work out. And But he is flexible enough to look at Grant and realize, he, he finally said, Grant is my bulldog. Grant was just inexorable in the way he pursued the troops. The same as Sherman. So he was intelligent enough. And also there was a um, a guy named Francis Lieber who wrote a military code in the middle of the war that is really the basis of uh, modern wars to a great degree, particularly, well, he said on the one hand, wars should be humane in the sense of treatment of prisoners, the avoidance of poison, uh, and he was really, he really was the father of the Geneva Convention. On the other hand, he was also a, a great believer in the use of overwhelming force in, in war, in kind of a hard war, because he says uh, sometimes the hardest war, the, the, the toughest wars are the shortest ones. And in a way, that's what Grant and Sherman do. They really, really pursue, pursue, pursue. Um, so, yeah, and, and Lincoln, when he found Sherman and Grant, he could kind of let them on a string, so to speak. Whereas when, with McClellan, he was always in touch with him and saying, can't you do this? Can't you do that? Can't you do the other? It so happened that McClellan was this very cocky guy who hated Abraham Lincoln, hated him. He felt very superior to him. And so, whereas Grant and uh, Sherman were much more humble people in, in these kind of rumpled uniforms and smoking their cigars and everything. Very, very tough and and very, very dogged. So yeah, Lincoln adapted to that. Very impressive. Uh, Now, something that I also caught my attention a lot was the discussion over religion. And you mentioned, you know, about half a century after Lincoln's death, that's one of the most hotly debated and contested things about him. You know, is he a Christian? Is he an agnostic, an atheist? Based on your research, you know, where do you land on that? How do you, how would you describe his uh, religion? He uh, loved to read the Bible. He uh, memorized um, many passages from the Bible. The Bible gave him, him comfort. He never joined a church, became a member of a church. He was raised as a Baptist, but he never joined the Baptist church or never attended. He would attend, but didn't join uh, the church in Washington, the Presbyterian church that his wife joined. But he would sometimes go. And yet 
those who call him an atheist or something like that are absolutely wrong. He, he was not an atheist. And he was a Christian in the sense of, he said, if, if you, we could boil down all religions to the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, that would be my church. That would be my church, my wonderful church. And um, so, yeah, uh, he wasn't uh, a joiner of a church. And yet in his own way, he was extremely spiritual. And one of the most private things we have from him is called meditation on the divine will. He wrote this on a scrap of paper to himself in the middle of the Civil War. And he said, you know, God is in control here. We don't really know his purposes. We don't know who is going to uh, win this war. All we can do is to try to do what we feel is just and right. Uh, but he will make the final decision. And in the second inaugural address, even after they had virtually won the war in 1865, uh, uh, in March when he gave the second inaugural, that was almost like a sermon. It has so many references to the Bible and to God and so forth. It's not really Christian in the traditional sense, but in a way it's pan-denominational. It's both Old Testament, New Testament, and kind of generally religious. And Frederick Douglass, after the speech, met him and said, Mr. President, that was a sacred effort. Sacred. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Now, you mentioned earlier how much of a fan Lincoln was of Shakespeare. And you talk about that quite a bit. And I really enjoyed that part of the book. Um, and I also find found it really interesting how culture and, and enjoying Shakespeare he thought of as kind of being a unifying force to both sides. Um, so can you talk a little bit about him and Shakespeare and, and how he thought that might uh, connect people together through that culture? Yeah, well, poetry, he also loved songs, plays. They were a few of the elements that were um, unifying, unifying um, things. Shakespeare was very popular in the South, in the North. There were certain songs, sometimes Confederate, armies would be across the river at night from the Union armies and they'd play songs back and forth and sometimes they'd join in and play the same song. <laughs> so culture for him was a source of unity. He gave us the first national Thanksgiving and under him, Santa Claus as we know it was originated by someone who loved him, Thomas Nast, who uh, 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 portrayed the first Santa Claus. And Shakespeare had the, a depth of meaning to him that was just so incredible. And uh, he loved, he not only memorized Shakespeare, but he did this not to impress people. He did this because these passages meant something to him. That's the only, he, he didn't do it like going to a cocktail party and saying, hey, I can recite Shakespeare or something like that. These, these were meaningful words to him. And when they, uh, Lee surrendered to Grant on April 9th, 1865, Lincoln was on a boat, a boat, from uh, City Point, Virginia to Washington. And everybody on the boat was kind of jumping up and down. And today I think we, we would say, mission accomplished and be, bring out a big banner or something like that. He was sitting there reading out loud Shakespeare and Longfellow and poems about death. And he was thinking about, in his own mind, the death, the, the death of some 800,000 Americans during the Civil War, how they killed each other and, but somehow Shakespeare said it best to him. It's ironic that he was murdered, murdered by a Shakespearean right. actor, John Wilkes Booth. And if Booth were alive today, okay, be on People's Magazine as the sexiest guy alive or something like that, because he was right. very handsome and all that. But he lo he loved Shakespeare from the but from the opposite point of view. He loved the blood and dagger Shakespeare. There's a lot of blood and daggers, and that's and. Uh, even just before um, he killed uh, Lincoln, he was talking about plays that he had been in and how he's going to enact the greatest play tonight. So it was a very uh, different interpretation of Shakespeare than Lincoln's. Lincoln's was really authentically deep. Uh, yeah. And I, sort of piggybacking on that, I also loved how you're talking about the Booth family. Obviously, they're a family of thespians, very well known in the theater. You know, Edwin Booth and Junius Jr. 
but they seemed to take that art form when they were on stage in a very intense way. And it sort of mirrored real life, the intensity that they had. Um, can you can you speak a little bit about that, about how the booths sort of used the yeah. stage to fuel what was happening in real life? His father, Junius Brutus Booth, was really probably the greatest Shakespearean actor of the 19th century America, a great, great actor. But <laughs> he went beyond method, act, method acting. I mean, he totally absorbed in the characters. And on some evenings, he had to be pulled away from the Desdemona of the evening for fear that he would actually smother this woman, and uh, the actress. And uh, more than once, he chased uh, the Richard III of the night out in the streets in the sword fight. I mean, he got totally involved. And the same, and uh, among the many Booth children, because uh, uh, Edwin Booth was uh, the brother of John Wilkes Booth. Edwin Booth loved Lincoln. John Wilkes Booth obviously hated Lincoln. Um, they were both from Maryland. But um, John Wilkes was the only one who really carried on his father's tradition. And uh, many times, you know, several times, uh, again, actors feared for their lives in sword fights on stage and so forth. And and he really thought that he was kind of in a play when he killed Lincoln, you know, and he killed Lincoln in a theater. He knew that play very well. This was not Shakespeare, it was a silly play. Uh, my American cousin, very frothy and silly, but he had played in that play a dozen times. So he knew exactly when to kill Lincoln, when the whole audience would be exploding in laughter. And then he leapt on the stage from Lincoln's booth and he flashed his dagger uh, he, because he was also carrying a dagger beside a gun. And he said, six semper tyrannis. In other words, uh, thus always to tyrants. He considered um, Lincoln a tyrant, a despot. And then he uh, exited on stage, stage left and uh, went to a horse and uh, he was captured 12 days later or something, but very theatrical. He really felt he was in a play. And even in his diary, Booth, he, Alone in the Woods, he was writing about plays he had been in. Well, this character would be considered a hero for killing a tyrant. And so would that character over there in his private diary. He, he was kind of psycho at that point. He was really uh, totally identifying uh, even more than his father. And, you know, you mentioned how he really, by assassinating Lincoln, wanted to create this chaos and anarchy and, and you know, have the whole country thrown into turmoil, but it really backfired on uh, backfired and ended up creating, you know, one of our most iconic loved presidents in history. So it's just very interesting how, you know, Lincoln became the giant that he is today. And, you know, what do you think continues to contribute to that to his legacy. People are still so fascinated by him. They admire him so much. What do you think it is about Lincoln that keeps hooking into people? I think what really hooks into people is the fact that he lived in the most divided time in our country. We're pretty divided today, very divided. But I mean, these people were killing each other, slaughtering each other. And yet somehow he kept firmly on that tightrope and was able, he never demonized his opponents whatsoever. Never, not once. He's a charity for all, malice toward none. And yet he was so firm principled, always pushing toward social justice. And sometimes he acted, sometimes as blonde and he leaned a little to the right and he right. had to be a little more conservative. Sometimes he leaned a little to the left, had to be a little more progressive and liberal but always staying on the tightrope to try to keep the union together while always pushing toward justice. And he loved it when the 13th Amendment was passed uh, by Congress in February uh, 1865. He said, that is the king, it, it abolished slavery. Now, uh, Booth thought he was going to throw uh, the nation into chaos because he had a, cons a fellow conspirator that, uh, that was going to kill off Johnson, his vice president, and they were going to kill off Seward, uh, the secretary of uh, uh, state, and uh, so forth. But those would-be assassinations got botched 
So we had Andrew Johnson, who was really a, quite quite a bad bad quite bad president. And it's interesting that the two presidents just before Lincoln, uh, Buchanan and Pierce, are always put in the bottom five of of American presidents. And the along with Andrew Johnson, the man who came at just after Lincoln. So it's just wonderful that we had our greatest president at just the right moment. Definitely. Well, I'm going to have Jennifer get ready to come back. I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'll let her come on and ask some audience questions. So if you are out there and you have anything you would like to ask, please make sure you put it in the ask a question field. Um, but I kind of wanted to end with a question of obviously this book you put blood, sweat, and tears into. It is absolutely fantastic. You did so much research, spent so much time on this. When all is said and done, what surprised you the most about Lincoln? Or what did you take away um, after all of this effort that really stays with you? Well, I was surprised by his openness um, to African Americans because uh, lately, you know, people have been criticizing him. They cherry pick uh, certain things that he said, particularly early in his career. But, you know, hey, at those moments, he was being blonde and he lived in Illinois uh, in a state that had the harshest black law in America, as Frederick Douglass called it, the Negro Exclusion Act. If you didn't live in, in uh, Illinois before then, and you tried to come into the state, you'd be either put in jail after 10 days or you would have a heavy fine and they would kick you out anyway. And yet, uh, Lincoln lived in a neighborhood with 21 African Americans. He became very close to some of them. And then during the Civil War, at first, Frederick Douglass thought that he was a little cautious and everything. But when Frederick Douglass met him, he, he said, this is the least prejudiced white person I've ever met. The same thing was said by Sojourner, Sojourner Truth, this feminist African-American. She came in. I've never met someone so open and, and genuinely concerned with, with uh, our people than, than uh, uh, Lincoln. And Martin Delaney, who was like... Um, Oh, he was like the Malcolm X of his day. I mean, he was really super radical. But he went to the, to the White House and he had a very, very intimate discussion, close discussion. And Lincoln appointed him the highest ranking officer among African-American officers and uh, in the Civil War. And then after Lincoln died, Delaney proposed a statue to him of a, an African woman on her knees crying her head off, millions of tears. And he wanted this statue to be paid for by contributions from African-Americans only by a penny a piece from the 4 million previously enslaved people, uh, a penny a piece to pay for it. Now that statue never got done, but a, another African-American uh, funded statue, the Emancipation Memorial uh, was funded mainly by African-Americans. So it's ironic that recently that statue was pulled down in Boston and they want to shut it off. And you know, the original is in Washington there's a copy in Wisconsin. There was one in Boston that tore it down. Why? Because Lincoln is there with the Emancipation Proclamation and the enslaved person is there rising up, uh, which is true. So the enslaved person is not on the same level. It's true. But uh, it was funded by African-Americans and uh, the first $5 came from Charlotte Scott, who was a washerwoman who had been en enslaved. She gave her very first earnings toward the statue. And... Um, uh, it was considered not progressive enough while it was being uh, built. So then in the course of being built, they made the slave tear apart his own chains. So, yeah, he's he's crouching, but he's tearing apart. He's very athletic, very muscular, and he's kind of looking up to the sky. So it's really been uh, mi misinterpreted, and uh, there's, there's no reason to uh, to tear down that statue. Well, thank you for that. Jennifer will come on for questions. As we're waiting for her, I highly encourage you all to order a paperback copy of this book. I could stay on with you for hours. We haven't even gotten to Mary Todd Lincoln or talked more about John Brown. So there are so many interesting figures besides Lincoln. There's so much information to learn about him. Even if you think you know it all, you don't trust me. So everyone go out and uh, click on that link and buy a copy because you will not regret it. 
So, <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> wow. I am going to read this book and I'm not yeah. like one, I, can, just, just, I, I read mostly kind of literary fiction, but I am, I can, cannot wait to read because I know, I didn't know any of this. And he is such one of the most important figures in, in not just American history, but world history, um, human history. And I, I, I didn't know any of these things. So thank mm -hmm. you for sharing all of that. And Mallory, thank you for the great job you've done of, of reading and asking thoughtful questions. Um, we do have some questions from the audience, as he said. And before we move on to them, though, Kit, uh, I think this is Kit, who's one of our historic interpreters, um, has put in the chat that Edwin Booth was a friend of the Clemens family. Do we know anything about that? I'd like to know more. Yes, he was. Uh, they were friends with one another. And they actually even uh, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, was an incorporator of Edwin Booth's uh, Players Club, which is still around in New York City. Um, so Clemens, along with Sherman and a few others, um, would put that together. Um, and we know that Clemens saw Edwin Booth on stage a few times. Uh, one time he even went backstage and was uh, giving Edwin advice uh, for Hamlet and telling him you should have another person on stage uh, making little comments during the production. And it was trying to give Edwin uh, some theatrical tips. So uh, they were friends, yes. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Greg Secord asks, uh, um, if Lincoln were alive today, what would he think about our current national political scene? Are there any parallels? It's a good question, Greg. Thank you. Well, if he were alive today, uh, he would remain a firm principled London. That is to say, he would definitely be a centrist. Uh, he would sometimes perhaps appear a little right, a little left. He wouldn't really change, I don't think. Uh, he would not play to a political base. Now, Lincoln began his career in the 1830s, long before the Civil War, playing to his base. And he got into a duel. Uh, fortunately, the, the duel was ca uh, called off at the last moment. It was a duel of swords. And the guy who was facing was an ex expert swordsman. Could have sliced him, sliced him up. But even though he was much smaller than Lincoln, but anyway, he was a fencing instruct, instructor. But Lincoln at that point was using pretty, pretty nasty, nasty language about his opponents at, at that point. What was called slasher gaff rhetoric, sensational rhetoric about his opponents. But you know, he learned that's not the way. That's not not what this country needs. It's begin becoming more and more divided. I just have to, I just can't be this way. Now, Petroleum Nasby was kind of that way, but he was a popular humorist. So he could be like Saturday Night Live or something like that. But Lincoln himself as a politician said, I have to keep this country together here. I, you know, I, I just have to keep this together somehow. And I can't demonize Southern people. I can't, you know, I can't, I, and I can't demonize Demo the Democrats were the conservatives back then, the Republicans were the so-called liberals. I can't demonize Democrats, you know, so, yeah. That's fascinating to think about. Thank you again for that good question. So our own Steve Courtney um, has been a long time, often on staff member uh, at the Twain House um, and wrote the beautiful book about, uh, about the Mark Twain House, the loveliest home that ever was, um, has asked, what led Ida Tarbell, the great muckraker and scourge of the Standard Oil Company, to write a two-volume biography? And I assume, Steve, that you made a two-volume biography of Lincoln? Was that? Right, yeah, Ida Tarbell. Yeah, she was uh, uh, kind of a, you know, Lincoln has had a lot of books written on him. And uh, she is, as you said, sort of a muckraking journalist and everything. She She saw him as a sort of a reformer uh, on behalf of social justice. But she was also a very, very good scholar. And I may say that mm. there are some of those older books on Lincoln. You know, her, her book, her two volume book is really, really quite good. Uh, there was a 10 volume uh, biography written by his secretaries, John Hay and John Nicolay that came out in 1890. And that's an interesting book too. But Ida Tarbell's, um, she does a little of what I do in terms of going into the ancestry a little more than other people do. Mm. Uh, she doesn't relate too much on the culture, 
but she's really interesting in the interest ancestry and background but yeah, yeah it's a good question thank you steve i like this one from mary claire collins i'm always curious about this and like to ask authors this question how did you decide on the title abe yeah abe. well it's yeah. funny he didn't like the name abe oh huh. he yeah he liked uh in fact the first paragraph says you know he he liked to be called Lincoln, just plain Lincoln. Hmm. But he said, I wouldn't have gotten elected if it weren't for Abe. I <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten elected because, and I talk about that a lot in my book, he was presented to uh, the public as Abe, the Illinois rail splitter in shirt sleeves, bearing an ax and splitting rails from the frontier. Honest Abe, Uncle Abe, Old Abe, and that name just spun culturally. So it feeds into my whole idea of cultural interchange and cultural uh, imagery and so forth. So, yeah. That's a really interesting thing to think about. I mean, we always do hear the honest Abe and you think that kind of just always existed, but clearly that was a, a construction and a construction with a purpose. Huh? Um, was he that honest? I'm assuming he was a very honest. Uh -huh. well, you know, <laughs> He was honest, but he didn't spurt out his feelings the way a lot of people do. His, frankly, if Twitter were, were around, he wouldn't be be whatever you know, spurting out his latest um, or, or or texting or something. He was a little canny and wary with his language. Mallory was kind of getting at this before. Yeah. Even in conversation, he would tell stories. He was very sociable. But he knew when to hold back too, or he learned when to hold back. As I mentioned early in his career, he tended to spout a little more and be kind of nasty and so forth. But mm. He learned how to be quite canny as, as a politician. Yeah. Mm. Oh, thank you. Dr. Brown says, do you think that Lincoln's murder combined with the slaughter of so many Americans psychologically led to the national cult of Lincoln worship? maybe even a form of national idolatry. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that he became a kind of martyr and there's a lot of hagiography that comes with that, for sure. And uh, the fact that he was killed just after he had attained victory and led and had the 13th Amendment and all of that. Yeah, it, it led to a lot of uh, sort of a cult of, of Lincoln. But you know, Walt Whitman said, a nation is defined by the death of its eminent people, what he, what Whitman called the heroic eminent deaths. And today we look back at Martin Luther King uh, and to some extent, you know, JFK, RFK, and so, and people that are assassinated, some of them, not all of them, but some of them that at least were trying to attain some kind of justice, therefore do become kind of magnified. And uh, Whitman said, it's really through the nation's deaths, it's, it's, it's great martyrs, that it, it, it's, it's more unifying than any constitution, than any laws or anything. It's a much more unifying uh, element in the psyche of, uh, of America. Thank you, and thanks for that really good question. Uh, Sharon Peters wants to hear about Lincoln's friendship with Gideon Wells from Glastonbury, Connecticut. Can you talk about that? Well, Gideon Wells was uh, his secretary of the Navy, and uh, I, th you know, I think that Gideon Wells was 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 a good was a good cabinet member. Was very steady um, and very calm. And uh, he Lincoln actually had a uh, much quieter, and I think uh, fundamentally a better relationship with with uh, Wells than with with other. Uh, uh, you know, people around him. Um, he was actually cozier with the, the Secretary of State, who was Seward. He, Seward would sit there and have cigars and drink wine, and Lincoln didn't drink or anything, so he would sit there and talk. But Wells, Wells was, was frankly kind of steadier. Um, Sa Salmon Chase, who was the Secretary of Treasury, um, was always competing, trying to get Lincoln's job, his position in the re-election in uh, 1864. So 
said, but Lincoln was charitable and named him Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He knew that Chase wanted his job and everything like that, but it shows his kind of sense of, but I admire the kind of uh, naturalness and quietness of his relationship with, with Wells. Yeah. Mm. No, that's lovely. Thank you. I'm glad that, that we got a chance to learn about that. Rick says, there's a community in North Carolina, Bostick, that insists that Lincoln was born there. Did you do any research on that? Yeah. Um, well, you know, there, <laughs> there are different stories uh, like that. Um, there's, there's no evidence of that. He was born in Aluru County, um, Kentucky, in a, in a log cabin uh, in 1809. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what the genealogy tells us. So you, you have to go with the genealogy. Uh, I double checked his genealogy and so forth. And, uh, yeah. Well, I can imagine other people want other places wanting to claim him. He's a pretty good native son to, to be able to claim, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, now this might be something you might not want to engage in, but um, Stephen wants to know, Stephen Roberts, what are your thoughts on Courting Mr. Lincoln by Lewis Bayard? Okay, what's, the, uh, what's my uh, idea about what? Um, I, I assume this is a book, Courting Mr. Lincoln by Lewis Bayard. Courting Mr. Lincoln? Yeah. Sounds like maybe it's not something you're familiar with, so maybe you don't. I'm not really too familiar with it. No. Okay. No. Uh, I think I've heard of it, but yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, so then I'm going to take another question from Steve Courtney, um, who has also posted in the chat that this is just wonderful, an eloquent interviewer, eloquent author. He just bought the book. So thank you, Steve. <laughs> and I agree on all counts. Um, by the end of the 19th century, the reconciliation Lincoln sought was accomplished after a fashion, but at the expense of African Americans. And today, we see an odd continuation of the Civil War as statues of rebels are finally torn down. Is this a good thing? Now, you've touched on this about when we talked about the, the emancipation statue. Can, um, is, is there anything else you'd like to say about the, the tearing down of these statues and how that contributes to the conversation? Well, it's, it's a great question. During the Jim Crow period, uh, early 20th century, actually between about 1880 and um, 1950, really, <laughs> uh, Lincoln was seized oh, upon God. by both, so both sides as a good guy by the reactionary side because Lincoln... They, they kind of cherry pick and look for his conservative moments when he was blonde and uh, tilting right, and the radical left side for moments when he was blonde and tilting left. So he was uh, viewed upon as a great reconciler uh, uh, during the Jim Crow period. And um, then with the rise of civil rights, he was still praised, but nowadays, a lot of times people are, are again kind of cherry picking and saying, well, he had this racist streak in him and all of that, but they're not looking at him in his times. That's why the subtitle of my book is Abraham Lincoln in his times. You have to consider him in, in, in his own times. The tearing down of Confederate statues, uh, you know, I don't like the erasure of history. I think that uh, statues maybe should have, should be emblazoned, those Confederate statues should be emblazoned with, I don't know what, a red cross of warning or something, yeah. something like that and an explanation that this guy died to defend slavery or something, you know, flashing warning or something like that. Um, they are relics of a kind of a sad time in America, the, uh, those Confederate statues. And I always like to use statues as teaching things. Unfortunately, in some locations, however, these statues and the Confederate flag itself which Lincoln hated. He hated the Confederate flag. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes are, are are honored and so forth. And I think that if there's anything we can do to dishonor that vision of the Confederates, it seems to me uh, that that's good. And I, I can understand why people are very uncomfortable with the kind of idolatry of Robert E. Lee or whoever. You know, so yeah. That was a very 
thoughtful and reasoned response. Thank you. And Steve, thanks for that. Uh, another good question. Um, well, we talked about this a little bit. Jonathan has a question about Lincoln being a Republican, but that was different from what we think of Republicans today. And um, he, he asks, would he be proud of the Republican Party today? But I think that's maybe not. Uh, is there anything you want to talk about? Well, you know, in my book, I don't get presentists. Presentists is when you use, when you're back talking about the 19th century and you bring in today's issues, okay? Yeah. I, you know, I really allow my readers to make their own leaps. Um, and because uh, I've read recent books on Vietnam, written during Vietnam, and they're referring to Hanoi and this, that, and the other, and but they're talking about the 19th century America. They seem very dated and everything. Uh, so I don't really like to kind of make that leap. I, I said earlier that Lincoln would definitely try to unify people. And I think that he would be more successful than anyone that we've seen recently on the politi political scene. I think, I think that he was so canny <laughs> uh, and also kind of down home. You know, he would joke at his own ugliness. He wasn't that ugly, but he said, I'm the ug ugliest guy around, you know. <laughs> he, he, and, I mean, that's why, again, Abe, old Abe, Uncle Abe, and, and even his opponents saw his magnetism and his kind of down home. It was hard for his opponents to kind of criticize him in that sense. So, yeah. Oh. Do you, uh, I'm going to invoke host privilege and ask the final question, which is, do you wish you could meet him? And, and what would you do and say if you actually could meet Abraham Lincoln in, in person? Well, I would really, if I were at a table with him, I would say, I think I know how you did it from studying you so closely, but can you explain how you managed to, because he, he had periods of depression as well, and how you fought through those moments of depression. When he said, at one point he said, I'm the most miserable guy on the earth. And if every, and at one time he wrote a poem about suicide. I mean, back then they didn't have psychotropic drugs or whatever, or psychoanalysis or anything like that. How did you manage, I think I know how you did it, but how did you manage then to reassert yourself, get back in the game and be so incredibly active and incredibly uh, vigorous in, in your pursuit of union and justice? So I, I think what, I think you would give me very, very good advice. Wow. Well, I wish you could have that conversation. Um, and I wish this conversation could go on and on and on. It's been absolutely riveting and uh, fascinating. And I really want to, on behalf of the Mark Twain House and Museum and our audience, and personally, I want to thank you both. And Mallory, you just did a, knocked it out of the park. Um, thank you. And uh, David, every mo uh, hanging on every word. So I hope that the time will come when you can come back to Hartford and um, visit the Mark Twain House again. You said you'd been many, many years ago. So we can't... And yes, hold the books up because uh, I, I can't imagine that you've sat through this conversation and you're not clicking on that link and, and buying your signed paperback copy of Abe. So, I'm buying a signed paperback copy because my hardcover is so well loved <laughs> that I want a fresh, clean, autographed copy. So I'm going to have two copies. <laughs> you Thank, you to, Thank you to the Mark Twain house. Everybody, well, I'm sure a lot of you have been there, but if you you go there again and uh, support it and uh, it's a wonderful house. Mark Twain um, is, you know, Ernest Hemingway said all American writing comes from one, one book by Mark Twain, Huckleberry Finn, and Hemingway loved Mark Twain. So, uh, and Mark Twain was just another cultural icon. So, uh, and he was influenced by a lot of the same humorists. If you read my yes. book, some of the same humorists that, that influenced Lincoln, influenced Mark Twain. So, yeah. And so William, William Dean Howells, who was one of Lincoln's campaign biographers, called Twain the Lincoln of our literature. So there you go. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Howells wrote, wrote one of the best contemporary biographies of, of Lincoln. So, yeah. And I'm sensing another biography coming up, David. Maybe you'll turn your sights on Mark Twain <laughs> next. You're tickling my fancy here. You really are. <laughs> uh, uh, you really are. Oh, I love Mark Twain. And, you know, there's a lot more to be said about Mark Twain, too. There really is. Very so, true. Uh, 
Gee, well, you, <laughs> you made me think of something here. Okay. <laughs> well, should you choose to pursue it? Um, Mallory's your, your person. So um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you both so much. What a delightful evening. Um, and um, we're just so grateful to have you both. And um, everybody buy the book and enjoy it. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks all for being here. Bye-bye. Good night.